الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome brothers and sisters to another installment of our light study of selected hadith from Riyadh al-Salihin. Tonight we'll look at the 35th hadith of our study and that is the hadith of Abu Hurairah selected by Imam Muslim rahimahullah ta'ala in which the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said Badiru bil a'mali fitanan ka qit'i al-layl al-mudlim yusbihu ar-rajul mu'minan wa yumsi kafira wa yumsi mu'minan wa yusbihu kafira wa yunsi ar-rajul mu'minan wa yusbihu kafira yabi'u dinahu bi ardin min ad-dunya So in this hadith Abu Hurairah reported that the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said what means outstrip with good deeds do as much good as possible by, as possible before turbulent times resembling a portion of an exceedingly dark night therein a man will awaken a believer but by nightfall he will have disbelieved another will reach the evening a believer but by morning he will have lost his faith selling his religion for worldly gain the prophet sallallahu in this hadith used the word fitan which we could translate as trials tribulations turbulent times and when the word is the word fitan is used generally it refers to one of two types of fitan one or two types of trials the first one is fitan ashubuhat the trials of spacious arguments dubious assertions and erroneous interpretations of religious related matters the second type of fitan is fitan ashahawat uh, fitan which we could call the fitan of temptations of impermissible predilections those prohibited matters that we are tempted to commit and those religious bans that we are tempted to violate so these are the two types of fitan that are generally referred to when the word fitan is used we said the first one is fitan ashubuhat the um, trials of dubious assertions spacious arguments and erroneous interpretations of religious materials or religious religious matters and the cause for these shubuhat could be in some cases ignorance lack of knowledge for example a person reads in the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to himself as the first person plural first person plural we using for example the bamir na or the mir nahnu so he concludes from that that God is not singular rather he is plural because he refers to himself with the first person plural and obviously that is a shubha that is a dubious assertion that is a spacious argument in reality God is one and the plural can be used in Arabic and in other language to to refer to what to a singular to, to refer to the singular the plural can be used to refer to the singular in Arabic and in other languages including English and an attempt to indicate praise, indicate status, indicate significance, etc. Uh, so this will be an example of a shubuh, a, a shubha, a dubious assertion based upon ignorance, lack of knowledge. If a person had expansive knowledge and thoroughly understood the use of the of the the, uh, the, the plural pronoun in Arabic, they would understand that this is uh, not an indication whatsoever that God is plural sometimes these shubuhat are caused by evil intentions with SF that a person really does not intend to find the truth or to um, does not intend to find the truth does not intend to relay the truth is intentionally trying to come to the wrong conclusion and transmit the, the wrong idea about Islam and sometimes this evil intention is, is the case because of the person being a non-Muslim or a hypocrite or a Muslim who is influenced by 
non-Muslims. And um, one example that comes to mind is that when I was in school um, doing my master's, obviously there were a lot of people who are studying Islam with evil intentions. And um, as you know, when the Quran was first revealed and it was committed to writing by the Prophet's companions, at that time they didn't have what we know today as a nuqat. The nuqat are those diacritical marks, those dots that are put above and below certain letters to distinguish them from other letters. For example, ta, ba, and tha, they, and nu, they all resemble each other, especially in the middle of the word. And what distinguishes them is the singular, the dual, or the um, three sets of dots that are either put above or below the letter, etc. And so, one of the dubious arguments asserted by some of these non-Muslims is that the Qur'an that we have now with certain diacritical marks that give a specific meaning to the words, that how do we know that that's really what was revealed in the first place? And it's not something which the companions or generations after them agreed to adopt this meaning when in reality that's not how the Qur'an was revealed because the diacritical marks, if you remove them, the meaning can, can be altered. And they make uh, even some, they give some examples which are insulting if you, if you, if you, um, uh, quite frankly, are, quite frankly, they are insulting. Uh, for example, and I'll just give this example just to show an example of a spacious argument, although it is very insulting to the Qur'an that this would be asserted, that the Qur'an's meaning could possibly be this. But if in the opening uh, verse of Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهِ If you remove the, the diacritical marks, it could be read, if you change the diacritical marks, it could be read, ذَلِكَ الْكَبَابُ ذَلِكَ الْكَبَابُ لَا زَيْتَ فِيهِ Which basically means that is the, like, kebab, the, like, piece of meat um, that has no oil in it. Obviously this is insulting, it is ridiculous, but it is an example of a spacious argument that basically the meaning of the Qur'an and how it is interpreted could be um, twisted by the removal of diacritical marks. Obviously this is a ridiculous argument. Why? Because the wording of the Qur'an and its pronunciation preceded its writing that it was revealed to the Prophet and he read it to his companions, ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِي And those alfal, that, that wording and pronunciation preceded the, what, the actual writing of the book. And so it, what standardized the meaning is not the writing and the diacritical marks or the dots, but rather the way that the Prophet read it out to his companions. Al-Muhim, this is an example of one of those spacious arguments influenced by uh, evil intentions, uh, often uh, promoted by non-Muslims, hypocrites, or those Muslims who are influenced by them. Last but not least from the examples of the causes of the shubuhat is innovative beliefs and rituals. That basically people introduce into the religion of Islam that which is not from it, with the intention of drawing closer to Allah through these innovations. And the shubha that comes as an extension of that is how can this be wrong? How can what we're doing be wrong when we're doing it to get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Or when there is some basis for it. It's not specifically prescribed, but there is some basis for it. How can it be wrong, etc.? So these are some examples of fitan ash-shubuhat, the trials of dubious assertions, spacious arguments, etc. The other uh, type of fitan as we mentioned, is fitan ash-shahawat. And we said that that's basically when there is a illegal predilection, something that we are inclined to, we're, in te we're tempted to do it, but Islam prohibits it. And unfortunately, these shahawat, these uh, prohibited predilections, are sometimes promoted, sometimes wittingly and sometimes unwittingly, by religious figures. Religious figures which have a great deal, they are prominent figures, they have a great deal of influence, they hold sway over people, and large segments of the Muslim community follow them. And so this makes the trial um, 
difficult or it makes it a trial from two angles. Makes the fitan, makes the fitan of shahawat a trial from two angles. One is because the natural predilection or the natural inclination the person has to commit this thing. They desire it, they, they incline toward it, they want to do it. That's just something inside of them that they incline toward it. And on top of that, they have a religious figure, someone who has knowledge, someone who has a certain level of credibility, and that person is basically authorizing them to engage in this prohibited behavior. So this makes it a, tri a, a, a trial um, twofold. And one example is uh, the trial of interest, taking it and giving it, participating in it, basically engaging in interest-bearing transactions, whether you are the recipient or the one who is doling out uh, the interest. For example, a person wants to buy a home and they buy the home from, uh, they go to a regular bank and they take out an interest-bearing loan to buy the home. There are actually some learned people who have authorized this and said it is legal and acceptable, permissible for it to be done. And so you already have people who want to possess these possessions which are highly expensive and take a great deal of capital which they don't possess and so they have this temptation to go ahead and, and engage in interest to buy those things and then you have a religious figure saying yeah you can do it there's nothing wrong with it etc and so these are um a, this is an example of fitan or fitnat a shahawat the trial of um desires and temptations etc now if you notice in the hadith the Prophet ﷺ, he described these fitan as resembling an exceedingly dark night, which implies a few things. One thing that they imply is that it will be very difficult for a person to, de to determine what direction to turn. Just like in, if you were out in the darkness and you couldn't see your hand in front of your face, you wouldn't know in which direction you should, you should walk. If I walk forward, there may be a, a hole that I might fall into. There may be a, a dangerous animal that I don't see, for example, a snake that might bite me. And so because it's dark, you won't know which way what, which way to walk, which way to turn in order to remain safe and secure. And by extension, it's as if the prophet is saying in a roundabout way that these, during the time of these fitan, it will be difficult for a person to distinguish truth from falsehood. He won't know which way to go in terms of truth versus falsehood, to discern truth from falsehood. And if that's the case, it won't be easy to reach the truth. Just like if a person was trying to travel in a dark night and he couldn't see his hand in front of his face, it would be very difficult for him to reach his destination. It would be very challenging. It's as if the Prophet is saying it would be difficult for people during these times of fitan to reach the truth. And as a result, a person can what? A person can lose his or her way and get entangled in these fitan and then realize that they're in trouble but not know how to get back to safety. Just like if one of us was traveling again on a dark night, can't see your, fan, your hand in front of your face and you just, you just try to you know, feel your way through this darkness. And then you get to a point where you just don't feel it's safe to continue on and you want to turn back, but it's so dark, you don't know how to get back. I'm in trouble. I've lost my way. I just wanted to retrace my steps and go back to where I was. I, I, I can't be sure because it's so dark. And the circumstance, a circumstance like this will naturally create what? It's as if the prophet is telling us this will create a great deal of... Um, a person will be frightened, a person will feel anxiety, they'll feel uncertainty, which way to turn. So the Prophet is saying that these fitin, he's implying that these fitin will create anxiety, uncertainty, and fear. And fear for the person. And when a person feels fear in darkness, and they feel this anxiety, they're likely to what? To grab onto things that they, don't, they can't see, but they feel like they might be something that can, can safeguard me. They can protect me. So I'll grab onto that in the darkness of night. So it's as if the Prophet ﷺ is implying that many people during these times of fitting will grab hold of things, embrace things, embrace falsehood because it resembles the truth. It makes them feel safe. It eases their anxiety. It's something. It's something to hold on 
that makes me feel safe even though I don't realize that what I'm holding on to is something which is dangerous, which is harmful, but it makes me feel safe so I hold on to it. Kind of like if a person um, was, um, again, if it was dark and the person grabbed hold of something that he thought um, would make him safe and in fact he was grabbing, the, grabbing hold of the tail of a wolf or something like that. So the person, he feels like, yeah, this is just something I can hold on to and it'll make me feel safe. It makes me feel safe, but in reality, if he only could see that this is one of the most harmful things he could put his hand on, etc. And so the Prophet, after giving us this, um, after, after painting this picture for us of what these fitna will be like and giving us all these implications of the danger and the threat posed by these fitna, he went on to say, he went on to be even more graphic, that these fitna will be so dangerous that a man will wake up a believer and by the time night comes will have disbelieved. Another man will go to sleep, nightfall will come and he'll be a believer, and by the time he awakens he will have disbelieved, right? And so what the Prophet is telling us is that these fitna of a shahawat with shubuhat, these fitan of spacious arguments or the fitan of temptations are so dangerous to a person's spirituality, to their religion, that they threaten to corrupt the heart and dissolve the faith inside the heart until it totally what? It totally dissipates or evaporates. There's no iman left. Suck the iman out of a person's heart. So this lets us know that these fitna that the Prophet is describing, these trials, these tribulations, these turbulent times cannot be taken lightly. They cannot be understated. The threat of these fitna cannot be under, cannot be overstated, I should say, and they should not be dismissed or downplayed. We have to take them seriously. We can't be walking through times which are very uh, resemblant of what the Prophet is describing. And I think what the Prophet is describing is very much applicable to the times in which we live. We can't live in these times which resemble what the Prophet describes. Fitanen, kaqita'il, al mudlim. Fitan, trials, tribulations, turbulent times like a piece of a dark night in which some people wake up believers and go to sleep disbelievers. Go to sleep disbelievers and wake up I'm sorry, go to sleep believers and wake up disbelievers. We can't be in a time like this where we see something that resembles like this and just be like, ah, you know, everything's good. Everything's good in the neighborhood. No, we have to be vigilant. We have to be vigilant and have our guard up and protect ourselves from these fitan. Then he concluded and he said, Ya bi odina hu bi aradim, bi aradim min dunya. I'm sorry. He will sell his religion for a worldly gain. And that, what that means is that religion for some people will lose its value. For many people, I'm sorry, will lose its value and importance in their lives and maintaining it will cease to be a priority. Maintaining my religion will cease to be a priority or will cease to be the number one priority. This means that some people will compromise or even abandon their religion if some worldly consideration seems of greater consequence. So basically, if they're put in a position where they have to choose between their religion and some worldly consideration, they will give precedence to the worldly consideration. Why? Because their religion to them is not that big a priority. It's not that, that important to me. It's not that important to me to maintain my Islam, to maintain my faith. And if I'm going to have to in order to maintain my faith, sacrifice this worldly thing, I'm not prepared to do that. That's how some people, the, the situation that some people will find themselves in. It's also important to note out, so I'm sorry, it's also important to note that this phrase, a worldly gain is not confined to wealth or property or tangible material riches but rather it can also refer to fame. Some people are so famous and they have such a large following that if they're forced to choose between something which will damage their reputation 
like apologizing for a mistake that they made, or maintaining their position. Basically, if they're forced to choose between their fame taking a hit and doing the religious thing, repenting and admitting error, they'll choose what? To maintain their fame. They'll dig their heels in and say, I'm, I was right about what I did. There's nothing wrong with what I did. They'll do that. And so we shouldn't think that all of the dunya is just money. It could be fame. It could be prestige. It could be a person's reputation. It could be influence, power, authority over people. That some people are in positions of power and they don't want to give that up. And sometimes their religion tells them that they can't do certain things that they want to do. They can't exert their power the way they want to. So they'll do what? They'll exert their power anyway and ignore the deen. Even if it means leaving the deen to exert what? Their power and influence. And this means what the Prophet is basically telling us that, that some Muslims will compromise their religion and sacrifice it because in their minds some amount of money, fame, power, authority, etc. is more precious than the deen in their minds, obviously. And again, this is something which re really looks like what we're experiencing today. Like the Prophet is, is describing something that we're seeing today. We're seeing this play out, unfortunately, not just with um, what, we can t what we could call political figures, but even religious figures, prominent figures in religion. Uh, we're seeing this as well. Then the Prophet basically, he started out the hadith by saying, Badru bil amal, outstrip these fitan with good deeds. As if to say, these fitan, they are unavoidable, they are certain to occur, they are something that you can expect, they've been decreed by Allah, and they're going to happen. You're going to be confronted with them, you're going to face them in your life. And the best way for you to prepare yourself and protect yourself from these fitan is to be a person who does as much good as he can and every opportunity that presents himself to do good, he seizes that opportunity. That's the best way for you to be spared to protect yourself, to respond to these fitan, which are going to happen la mahala. And the reason for this, or there's three reasons at least that come to my mind why the Prophet would say Basically, prepare yourself for these fitan. Guard yourself from these fitan with good deeds. Number one is because good deeds are from a taqwa. They are from God consciousness. They are from the fear of Allah. And the fear of Allah is something which Allah has promised as one of its rewards. That He will give us a light by which to walk if, there, if in times of darkness, in times of fitna, he will give us a light by which to walk and discern between truth and falsehood. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Hadid, He says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, ittaqu allaha wa aminu bi rasulihi yu'tikum kiflayhi min rahmatihi wa yaj'al lakum nura. He says, O oh, you who believe, fear Allah and believe in his messenger. He will give you two shares of his mercy and grant you a light with which to walk along the straight path. So one of the benefits of these, uh, these, um, these good deeds is that they are from a taqwa. And what will the muttaqi get? What will the person of taqwa get in exchange for his good deeds? He will get a light. And these fitan, the Prophet, he likened them to darkness. You will have a light in these fitan. You won't, back, you won't be like these other people groping around the darkness. They can't discern truth from falsehood. They get confused. You won't be like them. Why? Because you have the light from Allah because of your, your piety. Another reason why the Prophet recommended that we do good deeds to protect ourselves from these fitan is because these good deeds will entitle us to Allah's protection. They will be a cause for us to receive or to earn Allah's good favor and His protection. That He will protect us from these fitan and spare us these fitan because of the good deeds that we do. We'll be in Allah's good favor and earn His protection. Last but not least, from the reasons why the Prophet recommended this, is because perhaps we will get in, in, entangled in these fitan. 
that the fitting will come, we'll be confused like others are confused, and because of our confusion, we'll make errors. We'll say things and do things and believe things that we shouldn't say, do, and believe. We'll make mistakes, and those mistakes will earn us sin. But because of our good deeds, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive us and pardon our sins. He will pardon our sins because of the good that we did prior to the occurrence of fitna. We're human beings, we may make mistakes, but because of the good that we did, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will pardon those mistakes. So these are some of the reasons, at least three of them, why the Prophet ﷺ encouraged the Muslims prior to the times of fitan to, be, to busy themselves with doing lots of good deeds because those good deeds can either earn us Allah's mercy and forgiveness if we make mistakes because of the fitna, or they can earn us Allah's protection from the fitna, or they will give us a light by which we can traverse the fitna and avoid being misguided as others are misguided. And with that, we come to the uh, part where we talk a little bit about the lessons. What lessons can we take away from what we learned today? We'll talk about three lessons. The first one is that good deeds are a means to be spared trials and tribulations. So we should be keen to do lots of good and, do, and not to delay in doing good. Every time the opportunity presents itself to do good, we jump and we seize the opportunity. Number two, we must never place worldly con considerations before religious considerations. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the owner of the dunya and the deen. He's the owner of the world and the owner of the religion. If we put, and he wants us always to put the religion before the world. And if we put the world before the religion, we'll anger the owner of the world and the religion, and he may in turn deprive us of both the world and the religion. So we end up with nothing. We don't get the world because Allah owns the world. And if we anger him, he can deprive us of the world. And at the same time, if we forfeit our deen for our dunya, if we forfeit our religion for the world, Allah will, we, Allah will punish us for not following the deen and will be deprived of what? Of the benefit of the deen, meaning paradise and Allah's forgiveness. And then last but not least from the lessons is that we need to be vigilant. In these times, these times which, which very much resemble what the Prophet described, we need to be vigilant and we can't be naive. We need to scrutinize everything related to the religion. As uh, Muhammad ibn Sirin used to say, in the ilma, ilmu deenin, tandru amman ta'khudur He used to say, this knowledge is the knowledge of the religion of Allah. So be careful from when you take your knowledge. Scrutinize everything. Ask questions. What's the proof for this? What's the supporting evidence for that? Who is your precedent? Who, what scholar before you said what you said, interpreted the way you interpreted it, etc.? We have to scrutinize everything to make sure that we're following the straight path in terms of our beliefs and our practices, what we believe and what we actually do in the name of religion. And we have to make sure, thereby, if we do that, if we're always certain and scrutinized and we verify everything in terms of our beliefs and practices, we'll, we'll be able to avoid these fitan, whether they be related to shubuhat, these spacious arguments, or they be, will be related to a shahawat, that basically people are telling us that we can do haram things, that it's okay to do them, and we believe them. No, we won't be, we won't, we won't be fooled. Why? Because we've done our research, and we've dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's, we've scrutinized everything, and whenever something doesn't smell right, we'll always do what? Err on the side of caution. And with that, we bring today's session to a close. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those who listen to the talk and follow the best of it. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those who we teach His beneficial knowledge. And it would truly allow us to benefit from that knowledge by makers from those who put it into practice. Hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam mubarak. Hadha bin Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi jameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.